Um, anyway, uh, many moons ago, should we say, and uh, he did show a couple of fantastic slides, I've got to say, um, uh, of, of, of headstones and the likes. I know that sounds like a bit of a dead-end topic, but uh, it's quite an interesting one. So without any further ado, um, let you back to your headstones <laughs> later on, uh, I'll hand you over to John. Thanks, Tony. Um, I'm not going to stand up because it's handier here to... So you, if you don't mind, if you do mind, I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit down anyway. Uh, I'm a, a tapophile. Let that sink in for a while. My wife says I should be arrested for it, but it's not, you don't, it doesn't happen legally. Um, the definition of a tapophile is someone that has a passion for funerals, cemeteries and headstones. Now, that also fits the description of a got. <laughs> but they can be mutually exclusive as regards uh, the interest, you know. So I'm not really, I'm not a got, but I am a, I am a tapophile. Um, the owners I can take with a grain of salt, but being down the country, you're inclined to listen to Southeast East Radio, sometimes to check that you're not on it yourself for the, the death notices. Um, cemeteries, it, it's all that I'm really, we're really interested in. Uh, when I say we, there's a group of us with the North Wexford Historical Society, and we have surveyed, photographed, and put up on the internet about 40 graveyards in the North Wexford area, uh, and we hope to finish it this year with, let's say, the Gory Union, the whatever is available within the Gory Union, that we would have those up on, on the net. There will be about 7,000 headstones in it, in total. Uh, the inscription will be done, the photographs are done, and um, it's up on the net and it's free. Um, that was one of the things that we were approached by several different lots of people uh, and uh, we felt that one group said that, uh, one person said that uh, we were the water but he was the jug and he owned the jug so uh, we, we didn't go with him so we went on our own back. Uh, sometimes you think that you should have let's say linked up with IGP or whatever or with someone bigger than ourselves but I don't know whether we'd have got the commitment from the, the group, as we call ourselves, the grave men. Uh, no women. Um, they, haven't, they haven't been brave enough to come near us. Um, so it's all headstones, all graveyards we're interested in, but we've done them all, new and old. Now, it would be, as regards a, a graveyard, that there, that one that's up on, on, on the screen there, that's Clonatton. It's just about... What? It's, it's about three quarters of a mile from Gory Town, up from, uh, let's say, if you were coming in onto the Court Town Road, if you turn left up there, that's where it is. It's typical of old graveyards of that time. It's actually pre Norman. You won't see it from there, but there is the wall of the church is still there. And there is a feature on a Colinante, and it's still on it. Uh, it's a feature of pre Norman churches. So that's how old. And these type of graveyards are up and down the coast of Wicklow and Wexford. More the coast than inland, even though around the Slaney as well, which is tidal, you will get them as well. But they're a lot more, uh, the feet are a lot more up along the coast um, than they do inland. That would be, that's at one acre of, of a graveyard. It's circular uh, and it is about four to five foot raised above the ground around it uh, to do with all the burials. They're the sort of places that we love going into that we'll have headstones from the 1700s, uh, 1800s and we'll have all sorts of idiosyncrasies and everything strange on headstones. You get the lad that's 110, uh, he's 110 on the stone, he's at 92 on the, uh, the church records. So um, <laughs> you wonder who's telling the truth. Now. Uh, we have um, we have nothing like this uh, in Wexford, but an awful lot of the um, the passion scene headstones contain all these different items. And, and uh, this, uh, if you look at it, 
this is out not tall for in Kilkenny. And if you want to see them, Canisys Cathedral has them as well. Well worth a visit any time. Uh, you have, they didn't put Christ on the cross. They put the cross with the uh, crown of thorns. They have, um, his cloak is here. No, yeah, that's his cloak. You have the whip, the pinchers, the three nails, uh, the spear and the sponge for the gall, if you recall it. You have um, the ropes here for the, where, where he was whipped at the pillar. Uh, and you have the cock, the cock crew three times. Uh, here you will have his heart. This wouldn't be normal on it. His heart pierced by staggers, by daggers. And you have the hands and the feet, and they're pierced, little holes in them. Uh, over here, you have the 30 pieces of silver here on the bottom. Mm. And you have um, the bag for the 30 pieces of silver. Uh, you have the uh, sword, and this is the uh, scepter. The, you sometimes will show the scepter in a broken form that uh, Christ has died. They're dating from somewhere around the middle 1500s up along and uh, they will be decorated up to the early 1600s when the penal laws began to bite. An awful lot of them were destroyed during the penal laws because of their imagery. Um, but they're not the headstones that we have. This here is the oldest headstone that I have seen as a headstone. It is, here lieth the body of John, the son of Richard uh, Nicholas, who died February the 23rd or 25th, 1632. It's in Yall. It's a straightforward uh, headstone. It is not one of the uh, other ones that you would see. And it has nothing to do with a lord or a lady or a, a chieftain or anything like that. It is to do with um, the fact that um, it's the son of Richard Nicholas. Now, Yall was the port of the plantation of, of Munster, and that's where we believe this came from. It was brought in. The English had started to use headstones before we started using them in Ireland in general. Uh, if you see a headstone of that date in Ireland, it's generally to do with an English practice. Um, now, um, this here is the daddy of them all. Uh, this happens to be a headstone belonging to um, Dennis Cullen of Monasey, just outside of Gorey. And um, let me see. Um, um, yeah. um, this is, as you move into the 1700s in Wexford, this is what you get. This is dated uh, 1757. It probably was put up a bit later than that to think that he didn't start reading really until the, 19, the 1760s. But that headstone there is what? Uh, 250, 270, 60 years old? And you can read it perfectly, you know. Uh, he, um, he had his own way of doing things. He didn't do like what was happening down in, in Carrigan Shore at this time. In that area, they had they use all the symbols of the of the, the passion. Whereas in Wexford, we didn't. Um, he put a centurion on a horse with British Army uniform. <laughs> now, uh, he's, this is the same with the hat. He's um, the hat here and all. He has his hair on him. He has the hair cut. The stone is cut if you were up against it. You would see the, the hairs on the, on the horse's tail. There's the saddle. And sometimes on his headstones you will have the centurion with a gun on his... Um, so. But some people were making out that this was to do with the fact that he was depicting the British soldiers or the English soldiers as the evil ones. My view is that there was no church art at the time. Neither in the Protestant church there was no church art because of the Puritan attitude that there was no inside decorations. And as all it was in the Catholic churches, the churches there weren't churches, there were only mud cabins where a few would get in the door and that was it, there was no church art in it. Uh, so he just saw soldiers and he didn't know any different. Uh, he didn't know about togas, Roman togas and 
that sort of stuff, and body armor. He just saw British soldiers and their soldiers, so he, he depicted them as they were. Uh, but his work is excellent. Um, and um, um, how I got into this and how the lads got in, we got into it in Gory, there was a lad by the name of Jerry Mullins, who was an, an architect, uh, who was out of work, and he, um, he ran a course in the school in Gory about the archaeology of the graveyards of uh, Wicklow and Wexford. And uh, he, he had done his masters on the, um, the Passion Saint headstones in Kilmurray, Kilsheila, which was um, Tonmel, Carrigan Shore, and that area. And um, he, his work entailed, they're looking in Carrigan Shore in the fact that they have a census of the town from 1799. So you have these formulas that you can use. He was able to trace the number of headstones that were put up at the time and using this formula for the death rate. He was able to work out that um, there was only 1% of people commemorated with headstones in the late 1700s. Only 1%. Uh, and that was pretty, he was pretty scientific about it. Um, now, we're just going to talk a bit about um, how headstones are doubly informative, as Elizabeth Shee said. They give you two messages. They give you the message of the, um, of the inscription, the details there. But sometimes you will also get, as in this, with a 1% uh, uptake in headstones. This was making a statement of the wealth of the people <coughs> involved. This probably this headstone probably cost them about six pound. It was um, three shillings a foot, a penny a letter, and the um, the iconography was extra. So that's what he would you would end up paying about six pound for. Like um, agriculture labourers weren't getting any more than two and six a week at the time. Uh, I don't have to convert that for most of my audience here. I don't think. <laughs> um, but, um, like you take it, I come from a long line of uh, agriculture labourers and tradesmen, and my father was the first to put up a headstone to his father in 1935. That was in that family. There was no, and we're, the Nangle family is around firms from the late 1700s that I can prove there could be there longer. And yet, there was no headstones uh, put up to anyone until my father put up one to his father in 1935. And that was the way it was, like they just didn't have the money to do the job. And uh, there were more important things to be done. Um, but when we look at it, uh, that's a Cullen headstone. Owen, Cro Owen Grogan did a, a survey of 105 Cullen headstones in Wicklow and Wexford. And of the 105, uh, there was only uh, 35 of them that commemorated women. This was reflecting the position of women in Irish society at the time. They didn't have property rights, they were chattel, and um, so they, they didn't appear on the headstones. That's, and um, you would find all sorts of variations on that. Um, that um, the women, uh, they, were, they were relegated to different positions but mostly downwards from the men. This headstone you, you can't read is for a Thomas Cabinet who uh, died in 1792. And this is actually in Clanatton, the map I showed you earlier, or the photograph of the graveyard I showed you earlier. And all the details of his death and his age and everything else on it. Also, his two wives and his eight children. They didn't even warrant the name. Um, so, the, the uh, headstones are telling us more about the social situation in Ireland and, and women's lives in Ireland than we care to look at at times. Here's one from Yall, below in Cork. Here lie the bodies of Mr. Moses Allen's three children. He had them himself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, he had them himself. Like the, the mother doesn't appear, his wife doesn't appear. It's just him. Uh, as I say, headstones can be so informative on, on, on the basis 
of showing you uh, what, what the situation was for women in Ireland. Here's, um, here's one from Yad as well. I thought this was funny in my own way. I have a twisted sense of humour. Uh, it's in memory of uh, so-and-so, who is the second son of uh, James Gray, Esquire, manager of the uh, Provincial Bank of Ireland, uh, Yall. And the, ch the child died when he was eight uh, years and six months. Now, down at the bottom, he's there himself, uh, who died uh, 1859, aged 32. Okay. We come across here, right beside it, on the left-hand side. It's erected to the memory of James Gray. He has two headstones, or he's appearing on two headstones. Um, Ir Irwin Ayrshire, uh, manager of the Provincial Bank of Ireland, uh, Yall, uh, who died January the 16th, 1859. Also of his wife, uh, Elizabeth Gray. Now, if you look at, 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 at the sculpture, uh, how they were cut, the letters, how they were cut, they were all cut after the death of herself, who died, of Mrs. Gray, who died in 1878. She was nearly 20 years later, but he's put on the top of the headstone. If you compare, let's say, the D's, you see the way the D's are made? Yeah. With this line on it. It's the same here. So, whoever was left after herself, after Elizabeth Gray, they went and did, the, they, they compounded the same story again, that the man was more important even though it was put up after she had died, and he was on another headstone beside him. Um, but after all, he was the uh, manager of the provincial bank in Yall. <laughs> most important. Yeah, most important. That's what you have to get on your, your, your titles. You have to, have to be up there. Um, as I said, it's not just among the, the, the poor people that there was a... Actually, I, I would safely say from what I have read is that among the poor people, the women were more equal than they were among some of these people uh, that were putting up headstones. This here is, a, is, a, is a, um, a Michael Fanning, and he died after the wife, and he's put up first. The headstone wasn't put up, wasn't um, erected until, uh, until he died. She was left in the grave with no headstone, but when he died, the headstone was erected. Um, you can be sure he left money for it to have the headstone put up. Here's the ultimate, I think, in, in, uh, in, in uh, ignoring a, a woman. She doesn't even get her name. Erected by the, the widow Nolan. Uh, <laughs> you know, in memory of her beloved husband, Patrick Nolan. Like, the, the stone sculptor didn't have the the, the, the good manners to find a woman's name out, you know, no, erected by the widow now. And I think it's a lovely headstone, like there's um, uh, Savoriums, uh, a monstrance up here, uh, and he has an altar down here with a flag on it, uh, and he actually signed it. It's, it's, a, it's a, a Kerwin, a J. Kerwin, he was up from uh, Tinnahili. That's in Bally Fad graveyard. <coughs> but when you see that someone that was spending that sort of money and, and uh, he didn't bother to find out her name, but it was erected by the willing owner. That was 1833. Um, now we come along and have a little bit of a chat. Uh, as Tony I told you, we, we did a course with, with Sean Murphy. And Sean, Sean's relations and ancestors were down from Kerry, from the Gaeltacht in Kerry. And he used to always talk about the fact that he had never seen a headstone in Irish, uh, even though it was in the Gaeltacht areas, and they were dying air, like when the, when the Gaeltacht was um, was very strong down there, and still strong in, in the place he was talking about. But you take it in the late 1700s, there was half the population speaking Irish, roughly, it was roughly half the population were speaking Irish. And yet, uh, there has been, I, I looked in Connemara, and I've looked in Kerry, um, we did the Ring of Kerry one time, and the wife said she didn't do the Ring of Kerry, she did the Ring of Graveyards. Um, <laughs> but um, the, um, we, we, we've never found anything in Irish, unless it's very recent. 
Um, now, Sean didn't have a theory on it, but our good friend Jerry Mullins, who was from Waterford, where it was Irish speaking, he believed it was to do with the, um, the Catholics didn't have a burial site for themselves in the mistaken belief of the, in, that the penal laws forbade it, which actually it wasn't, but they were still being buried in the Protestant graveyards around the Protestant churches. And he believes that, and Waterford would have been very uh, strong in Irish, that it was the fact that if you put up the headstone and the Protestants are walking out of the, out of the church in, the mor in that morning, if it was in Irish, they couldn't read it. But if you put it up in English, they could read it. So what you were doing was you were saying, we have arrived. I've put up a headstone to my father. Uh, and once it's in English, you can read it. But if it's in Irish, they could ignore it. Uh, this was his theory. I, I'm um, willing to take uh, contradictions on it if someone else has a better theory. But I think it's a good one. Uh, but this is the only Irish one that I've seen. Of, any, of that era. Uh, it's in memory of uh, Andrew um, Landers. He was born in County Clare in Ireland on the 27th day of uh, May, 1912. Uh, and he died when he was um, 84. And fear Gael and Jogshe. Uh, no, that's in Port Ferry in South Australia. <laughs> uh, as I said, uh, I'm, I am a, I am a taffophile. I, I can't pass a graveyard, but it's it's amazing to see it. It's there in the old Irish script, and uh, Sean, when I showed him the photograph. Uh, he said, I've never seen it before or anything like that at that stage, you know. And this is 1912 it is. Um, but that was the theory of Jerry Mullins. I, I don't know, I'm willing, if someone has a contradiction to make or is on that, I, I'd love to hear it uh, for the reason why. Now, when you're in Australia, you never miss a chance to go to a graveyard, especially Waverley Graveyard um, in Sydney. Now, uh, that is our good friend, Michael Dwyer's, um, you couldn't call it a headstone, um, it's, it's his um, a memorial of the dead. This was put up in, uh, it was start, he, when, when it was coming along to the centenary of 1798, he actually died in, in 1825 and the wife died in 1860 and there were interred in a vault in Devonshire Street, down in Sydney in the centre. And Easter Sun, Easter Saturday they, they took out the, the two coffins and placed them in the larger coffin. And they brought them into St Mary's Cathedral. And that's another statement. St Mary's Cathedral in, in Sydney is it's a colossal cathedral, you know, it's a statement that the Catholics have arrived. Um, and um, they had high mass and everything else, and it was one of the biggest funerals to date at that time in, in Sydney. And uh, they brought him up and they put him into the starting of a vault here. And they constructed uh, this uh, memorial of the dead. But they have all sorts of things on it. You have the capture of, um, uh, what's his name, Fitzgerald. You have Robert Emmett. You have, uh, you have uh, Vinegar Hill. You have all sorts of scenes on it, uh, and it wasn't it wasn't finished for two years. The other thing that's on it here is um, that space there is left for Robert Emmett's epitaph. You know the story with yeah. left my epitaph, not learning is taking her place. But that's what that space is left there for. Uh, that's thirty foot high. That's thirty foot wide, and twenty foot deep. Uh, the Irish in, in, in the earlier part of in, in Australia, they weren't overly welcome, uh, but this was a case of them asserting themselves. So they're really saying, we have arrived and uh, we're staying, you're not going to get rid of us. But what they also did on the back of it, they put in the 87 people 
from the rising in 1798 the leaders they're all there uh, Edward Fitzgerald Theobald Wolf Tone uh, the Shears John and Henry Shears um, it, I, actually it's such a, a big back wall it's next to impossible to get it into a photograph and down here they have the 1916 leaders and here you have um, the hunger strikers from the north <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, let's look at the, at the overall front and back. I, I, I can ignore the back, uh, that small piece at the back. Um, but when you see something like that, you just can't miss it. And this is this is a graveyard with 900,000 buried in it. Uh, a huge graveyard with colossal monuments. But that dwarfs everything. Mm. And when I said to you, to the girl in the office, I said, um, where's the, the, the Michael Dwyer monument? She says, go down the path, you can't miss it. Like, and that's that's too true um, but they're saying the message there is not just Michael Dwyer it's they're painting the picture for the, any of the, the, the palms or whatever they wanted to call them at that time the Irish are here and we're going to stay uh, and um, as I said they have a double message in it that's the back wall as I said now what's the difference lads is that old one? Yep. Yeah. Traveller. That's a traveller. <laughs> yeah. But is it any different than Michael Dwyer's? Yeah. We have arrived. Yeah. That's what they're saying. Your Padre Pio over here. Um, it's O'Brien's. Um, like it's, I don't know, I'd say there's a damn all change out of 150,000 there. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but this is what I'm saying. The message, all the details are there of the mother and father and, and a couple of children. But the message is, we have arrived. It's the same as, as Michael Dwyer's in in um, in. in um, <laughs> it might just be bad taste. <laughs> Well, what would you call Michael the wires at the time? You know, <laughs> if you looked at it. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, 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 I still think the message is that we have arrived. Yeah. Deep faith. Um, the faith is, is grand, but uh, <laughs> I think the, the show is, is more important. Yeah. Um, now, as most of you know, the, when you're doing looking at the valuation books, you'll see LAP around 1908, Land Act Purchase. Uh, this is Firm's Graveyard. It was opened in 1901. And look at all the big uh, Celtic crosses that are here at that stage. This would have been a pretty strong farming area, and they had got their land at that stage. And that's what they're stating. We have arrived as well. Uh, if you move down along it, most of them, the headstones get smaller as you move down. But like at that stage, it was, we have arrived. It's the same as what, as I said, the travellers were saying. So, um, that's more or less what I was going to talk about as regards the, uh, the, the double message that you can, that you get from headstones. Uh, so I was going to have a quick run through of, uh, my passion, uh, uh, first, uh, my <coughs> You're fine. What have I got? Try the mints. Have I? Okay. Uh, this, this is one of the other things you can learn. Maybe I, I, I showed this here the last night I was here. Uh, it also shows you the evolution of, of surnames. We have two. Um, we have a headstone in Kilnahue and a husband and wife and Colin is spelled different on both on the same headstone, their husband and wife. And uh, here's K's. K's in 1849 was K-Y-S, 1849, 1890, 1902. In 1911 is K-E-Y-S. Uh, in 1926 is K-E-Y-E-S. So you have, inside of, 50, 60, or 70 years, you have a change, you have two changes in the name. Uh, and it's, from a genealogical point of view, it's informative, to say the least. We all are aware of 
the pitfalls we have when we're looking for Lacey's or Donahue's or Gallagher's or especially in Donegal or Doherty's or you know we all are aware of it but there it is written in stone uh, it's a good way of getting the message across to beginners like I uh, oh no we were always O'Connor's uh, yeah I, I found just going uh, as an aside uh, Connor's I found a man several men and they're Moses Connors and they're born and baptized in Mexford and they're buried as Aidan O'Connor. No, we were always O'Connor. You see, Connors' uh, name in Mexford will be associated with travellers in a big way. Um, but they, they don't want to be associated now, but up until the 1920s, most of them were Connors. That's all they were ever called. Uh, but as I said, Moses is to do with Moog, young St. Aidan. And it was, um, like everything else, it was mongrelized into Moses. And uh, you got, there, there's an odd person still called Moses in Mexford. But Moses Connors, he was baptized and registered as, but he died as Aidan O'Connor. Um, let me see, I have to get out of that. Um, now, as regards passion scene headstones, I'll go through it fairly quickly. Ida Lask came down uh, when the husband was part of the OPW in Glendalough. They found these fancy headstones when they cleared all the rubbish. And as I said, when you think back on it, it was only in the 1940s that they started clearing Glendalough. And uh, they thought that it would only be found in, um, in place of... Uh, Ecclesiastical importance like Monaster Boyce and, and uh, those sort of places, but uh, no, they weren't to be found. I, he, she came in contact with a father Ransom in Wexford who knew a little bit, and uh, he said, there, there's, Those sort of headstones are in Wexford. So she came down and she did a survey on it. Of, um, she was very impressed. She was, the, she was the specialist in wallpaper and fabrics in the National, or in the National Museum. Uh, and she um, she wrote several articles for the um, what is it the Royal Irish Antiquarians is it uh, for that journal and she, then she published it as a little book but uh, this is the uh, concentration of passion scene headstones in Wexford that she found at that time uh, I reckon that she's out by about twenty graveyards. There's at least another 20 graveyards with uh, passion scene headstones. <coughs> this is the one that they found in, in, Wick, in Glendalough. And just to give you a little bit of an idea, if you're going to a graveyard in the afternoon, bring a small mirror with you. Because there's the difference. That's a small mirror reflecting the sun across it. That, that headstone, because of where there's a big tree in front of it, never gets sunshine on it. But if you reflect it, that's what you can get. You have um, the, the passion scene there, as I said, there's the horse again, the centurion, uh, with the good thief and the bad thief. Um, and uh, he has someone here with a lyre, someone here with a big rosary beads. Uh, this is Stephaton with the spear. Um, there's the hammer, the nail. Um, there's the pinchers with a nail. And he'll have a third nail somewhere else. Uh, that's one of his more elaborate ones. He generally stuck to the, and this is where we, as I said earlier, this is where I think we think he got his inspiration from. Uh, this one is below in Yall in Cork. Uh, it's actually two Nagels. When the the Nagels left uh, Kildalki up in Mead, where there were the Earls of Navan, they went to Cork and they dropped the end for some reason. So there are Nagels down there, but they pushed in. Here in the bottom corner of this uh, slab, they pushed in the 30 pieces of silver, the skull, the hammer, the pinchers, the three nails. Uh, that's as much as they put in. Um, but there's one in, in St. Mary's in Blessing in Bottom Glass, and it has the full, uh, everything is on it. Um, the whole, um, the whole um, lot of... of um, you, you name it, it's on it. Like even the, the dish for for Punch's pile of washing his hands is on it. Um, this is below, you can see, remember when we look back at at this here, 
there's no Christ on the cross, there's the hands. Um, that's down in Nachtofer in South Kilkenny, and this is in uh, Kilshalen, going into Clonmel on the left hand side. No Christ on the cross, the hands and the feet, um, the ladder, the cloak, and the three dice. You, heard, you know the story about that Christ's cloak was woven into one piece, yeah. so they wouldn't tear it as they would have another victim. So they cast lots for it, and they're the dice. Um, over here, do you remember the, the, the daggers? Well, they put the three nails into the heart of Christ here. That's the hammer. There's the pinchers with a nail. This here is the, um, that's the scepter. The sun, or the moon and the sun, the man and the moon. See him? He's, uh, it was supposed to be the, in medieval times, supposed to be the, um, the um, home of the archangel Gabriel. And the sun was glory. Um, but you can see the influence there in particular. That is around 1740. This here, you might be able to make it out, but that there is St. Veronica with the towel. We found this in, in on, covered up with grass one time when we were down in South Kilkenny, just outside of Kilmacow. And uh, we walked on it, and we said, there's something there, and we kicked off the grass off it. And this is what it is. There was a lady went around in the, in the 40s, and she went and... Uh, drew all the pictures and there's that same one that's in the in the grass in, in Kilmacow and there's St. Veronica like I, I despair of, of places like that that wouldn't lift it up and put it up again the wall because there is a wall there you have all the all the emblems there there's the, the water for to wash Punches Pilate's hands you've um, all that sort of thing on it and up here is another one that's below in, in uh, in Callan. If you want to see headstones or tools like that, canises. This is one we have in Gory. It's a very plain one. It's 1634. It's to the Bishop Ram and uh, it's in Latin. It's for him and his posterity and it's the only one we've ever seen in Wexford with um, the, the lettering is cut in relief. All the headstones in Wexford are cut, are incised. They're cut into it. Um, and that was 1634, and the next headstone or memorial of the dead that's there is, eight, is um, 1716, uh, and that's that one there. So, but the population of North Wexford, the Protestant population of North Wexford at that time, was approaching 27% of the population. It was second only to North Armagh, and that was their church. There was no churches outside Dahl around the countryside at that time. And that was their church and their graveyard. And they were burying them in that graveyard. But there's 80 years without a headstone. So headstones were not considered important at that stage. Um, <clears throat> this here is uh, Kilmurray. This Kil remember the uh, old um, poem, Kanyenemi Diamond? Kanyenemi Fastigan Diamond. Kilkash. This is in Kilkash. And this is down in, 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 in South Kilkenny, Tipperary, Waterford, Border area. But you can see, they, that headstone will be slightly smaller than Cullen's. And yet, they pack in an awful lot of um, symbols and, and uh, everything else into it. Uh, you have the 30 pieces of silver, you have the bag for the silver, you have the Christ cloak, you have the, um, the dice. No, <coughs> the dice are over here, sorry. That's the box for the money. Uh, this is the box for the tools. You know, there's everything on it. But he did a unique thing. He put stars in. We think that the uh, the sun and the moon will be reflecting between the sixth and the ninth hours. There was, there was darkness. And uh, that's what we think that in, in the Wexford situation is is the way it is. That's another one of the, as I said, it's this, and this here is the um, the temple with, this, with the rock rolled back or the tomb with the rock rolled back, sorry. Do we live the temple on other... You see, he even put the numbers on the dice. <laughs> and that's there from probably 16... or sorry, 1762 or 3. This one is up in Clonaton. It's another one of Cullen's. Um, you can see the detail. We think we had a, a bit of damage caused by... what would you call them? Iconoclasts. Uh, they had a... 
the Church of Ireland people had a, a thing about um, the crucifix on a headstone. We've had damage in, in this was in, in 1800, we think it was around 1800 the damage occurred. A lot of the headstones are chopped in the middle. They chopped the, um, the, um, the, the, the Christ off the cross is what they were aiming for. But the, here's a bit of institutional damage. Imagine, uh, this is an article, imagine I'm going and, and, and slap dashing out and they slap dashed the headstone, they, wouldn't, they didn't wash it off. Uh, I, I, I despair of some people. Uh, this is what he, Cullen did work for the Church of Ireland people as well. No Christ on the cross. He put a church in and a forget me not, I don't know, this is broken a bit here, but there he is, he signed it. He didn't sign all his work because uh, we found that the further away from home he got, the more likely he was to sign it because his work was known locally. But Jim Byrne, uh, that's another column on, I'd flick on past that. That's a, another one for the Church of Ireland. He just put trees on it. Um, and that would be the general Church of Ireland headstones without any um, iconography on it at all. They might put a few flowers up top, but they wouldn't have any religious iconography, like as, as headstones are in England. Now, this is a Jim Byrne headstone. How do I know that? Because he signed every headstone. Um, the Man in the Moon, or the Moon Crescent, here's <coughs> Glory. Christ on the cross, you have Mary Magdalene, you have the Blessed Virgin, you know the Blessed Virgin because she has the crown, and at the foot of uh, Christ's face <coughs> is the serpent, symbolizing evil, and the skull is in here, symbolizing death, but in the positioning of the, of the tomb, it's the victory of Christ over evil and death. Um, he put in these um, arrowheads and the IHS, his would be very much on that formula, um, and his lettern is, is, is pretty good still. Someone must have came along here with um, Parazone was a big thing going around one time, cleaning, cleaning headstones. <laughs> that is a, a um, um, what's his name? Martin Kenny. He was a he, he served his time with, with Byrne but he wouldn't be near as good. As we say he ends up with uh, with um, two women expecting children by the look of things. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but his, his lettering is good and, and like you, if it was in another county and uh, you weren't comparing him to such good tradesmen you would say that's fantastic you know uh, this is a James Butler uh, I think this man might have trained in England because nearly every one of his headstones has uh, the hourglass on it and that's what you will find in, in the old style in England the hourglass will be there um, I think there was two generations of them. He signed it up here, James Butler. Um, as I said, we're blessed in Wexford in that they signed him. I think this is his son, this is another James Butler, but it just gives you an idea of, if you're going taking photographs of headstones, the best time to do it is in the morning. Like that's taken with the sun gone in, that's taken with the sun, the sun after coming out. It's only a couple of minutes. But that's sun, sun in, sun out. But all his serpents have the mouth open. You see it here? And I think that's his signature. He signed it down here on the right hand side. You'll find James Butler. See it there? Uh, this lad was a Redmond, we think. And <clears throat> if the 30 pieces of silver, which is rather rare in Wexford, that would be not a normal one. He has, he has, he has a, an imitation of Cullen's work, <coughs> but very much a prancing horse. He has Stephaton over here, the pinchers, the nails, the hammer, and Christ on the cross with shown off raw ribs on him, like at that stage. And he has the, the chalice here collecting the blood. But here he has the, the, the cock on the pot. Um, you heard about the cock on the pot. Judas came home after Christ had been crucified and he wanted, the wife had the chicken in the pot. He wanted, he wanted a rope to go and hang himself that Jesus said he was going to rise from the dead. And um, she says, he's not going to rise from the dead. He says, that cock there has as good a chance of coming out, out of that pot and up comes the cock. 
Mm. And that's the story. You'll find it in, in all over different places. You'll find a cock on the pot. Uh, it, there's one in the, in the uh, do you remember the Irish Times did, what was it, 100 um, historical oh, artifacts? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they had a prayer, <coughs> a prayer stone which they allowed was, was um, used during the penal laws and that they kept this as a, 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 a what was some form of, to have a place for devotion. When they couldn't go to Mass they would pray at this stone and on that stone was Christ and also the cock on the pot. Um, if I'm telling you lies, I've been told lies. Um, but the, the amazing thing about it is that he, that headstone is just outside of Gory. But there's a headstone, and I can't see any difference in it, in the structure in general. That's up in Sir Kieran in Offaly. That's 85 miles away in, in the late 1700s. And there's another one up there as well. <coughs> Um, <coughs> but those two headstones, you would say, like when you look at the at the the cut, they're the very same. And the other thing about it is that it's in sandstone, and they have only limestone above in Offaly. They don't have sandstone. Right. Um, and they have another two <coughs> headstones, imitations of that, but they're badly cut, and they're cut in limestone. We we were looking in Wexford in the fact that we didn't have limestone. Uh, and limestone doesn't weather as well at all as sandstone. Just if you happen to go into a, a maybe a Church of Ireland graveyard or whatever, and you see initials on the headstones, you're looking at a Quaker probably. Um, they weren't supposed to have headstones up until about 1850. They were deemed to be ostentatious. But uh, a good few of them went and put up headstones but with the initials on it. Um, that is in, in a small graveyard, the Quaker graveyard in, in uh, Scarwedge. Now, that's where we're at. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh. <coughs>